Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSurge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababella Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Cram Search from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. Today we are going to have a look at a paper published in uh, JAMA Surgery uh, entitled Comparing Laparoscopic Elective Sigmoid Resection with Conservative Treatment in Improving Quality of Life of Patients with uh, Diverticulitis, uh, also known as the LASER uh, trial. This is followed by the first part of uh, two. Uh, sessions that Professor Sababara Subramania is going to conduct on descriptive statistics. Which one should I use? Throughout these two sessions we will be looking at the core principles uh, of descriptive statistics uh, which uh, is an essential part of uh, not just doing the search but also reading the search and understanding it. So stay tuned for more. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Emma Lumley and I'm presenting with Arslan Panu. Um, Many thanks for having us speak here today. Um, we'll be presenting a recent paper from JAMA Surgery published in November, a Finnish randomized control trial comparing laparoscopic, laparoscopic elective sigmoid resection with conservative management in improving quality of life in patients following diverticulitis, the late trial. A bit of background, diverticular disease is a common disorder that can reach up to 70% 70, 70 prevalence in the over 80s. The commonest compl complication of diverticular disease is acute diverticulitis the severity of which has a vast range from mild attacks, of life -threatening per from mild attacks to life-threatening peritonitis. Diverticulitis tends to recur and reduces patients' qualities of quality of life. It is thought that sigmoid resection might act to increase the quality of life in these patients. It is thought also that the only randomized controlled trial comparing conservative treatment with elective sigmoid resection in patients with recurrent diverticular disease or, or persistent complaints after the, uh, diverticulitis was the direct trial published in 2006. The trial has subtle differences from the laser trial in that it didn't recruit anyone who had had abscesses and the laser trial looked more at recurrent diverticulitis and less at persisting pain than the direct trial did. But the cohort was mostly similar and with the same variables. The research question asked, um, is sigmoid resection superior to conservative treatment in the improving the quality of life of patients with recurrent complicated or persistent painful diverticulitis. So using the PICO model, our population was patients with recurrent, complicated or persistent painful diverticulitis. The intervention was a sigmoid colectomy. The comparison to this intervention was conservative treatment involving written information, dietary advice and a prescribed fi fibre supplement. And the primary outcome being looked at was the difference in gastrointestinal quality of life index between randomization and six months. The hypothesis being sigmoid colectomy will be superior to conservative management in improving patients' quality of life. Aslan, do you want to take us through the trial's inclusion criteria? Okay, right. So the inclusion criteria uh, are either there should be three or more diverticulitis attacks within the two years with at least one episode which is CT verified, or one or more episodes of conservatively treated complicated left chronic diverticulitis, or prolonged pain or bowel symptom disturbances for at least three months after CT verified acute chronic diverticulitis. Uh, the complicated divert chronic diverticulitis was defined as uh, an attack of diverticulitis with either an abscess or a perforation or um, stricture or fistula formation. Um, and all of these should had uh, luminal investigations within the last two years Okay, Emma, do you want to just tell us about the exclusion criteria? Yeah, absolutely. And there was a number of them. Multiple comorbidities preventing elective or lap, elective lap surgery or laparoscopic surgery for any reason. Anyone with colonic stricture, uh, strictures or fistulae. Active malignancy if it was found or previous resection of the sigmoid or rectum were excluded. Diverticulitis that had not settled or um, seen by persisting raised inflammatory markers. Um, if there was no colonoscopy, sigmoidoscopy or virtual colonoscopy evaluation within the two years, any patients that were too young or too old, if they were pregnant or if for any reason due to either dementia or psychiatric condition, they were unable to answer the health survey, all these um, 
patients were excluded. So if we could have the next slide. Um, so looking at the methods, this was a multi-centre, parallel, open label, randomised clinical trial undertaken at two university hospitals and three community hospitals with enrolment between September 2014 and October 2018. The randomization was one to one with variable block size, either two, four or six, generated using the R statistical software with the block rand's one to one package. The sequence was stratified according <laughs> to the inclusion criteria. Arsan, if you want, wouldn't mind taking us through the timeline of the study. OK, so. Um, acute diverticulitis study where they looked at the outcomes at zero, six months, one year, two year, four year, and eight uh, years. Um, obviously, in the there was a conservative limb of the study as well as a surgical intervention in conservative group. The patients were given a dedicated written instructions about to increase the fiber in their diet and to take fiber supplements. And surgical patients had laparoscopic sigmoid colectomy, again, standardized about how they performed it. Um, they had the intention to do an interim analysis at 66 patients. Um, the sample size was calculated based on the 12 point difference in the GI quality of life index. The GI quality of life index was measured as a baseline at zero month and then from zero to six months and then thereafter one yearly and two yearly, four yearly and eight yearly. The primary outcomes were GI quality of life index with secondary outcomes, uh, SF36 questionnaire recurrence, need for surgery, complications, overall mortality or stoma rate. Now results, the sample size was calculated that uh, they should recruit 120 patients to show significant difference uh, with interim analysis planned at 66. Um, they used t-test for continuous uh, uh, secondary outcomes and primary outcomes, uh, as well as continuous secondary outcomes, which were not normally distributed. Man Whitney U test was used. Um, they also used Fisher Exact for category secondary outcomes, where the number of patients was less than five in single cell, and Chi scale test if they were above. Um, looking at this concert diagram, the 90 patients were randomized, 45 each are located in each limb. Um, there were exclusions, four out of them, and 41 were analyzed in the surgical group. And there was only one patient excluded in the conservative group, and 44 were analyzed for clinical outcomes. Uh, there were further exclusion, and only 37 were analyzed in the primary outcome in the surgical group, and 35 for the primary outcome in the, surg in the conservative group. Emma, do you want to take us through this baseline characteristics, please? Yeah, so this table one, um, taken directly from the um, paper, shows some of the baseline characteristics between the two ra randomised groups. As you can see, there are not many differences between the two groups when looking at the, the mean age, sex and BMI of these patients. There were multiple other characteristics looked at, including comorbidity, frequency of pain and location of the diverticular disease. And in, the, in these, there was also no major differences between the two arms of the trial. One difference was noted in that two of the surgically allocated patients had more severe disease with Hinchy grade three diverticulitis when compared to the non, um, when, when compared to none of the conservative allocated patients. Uh, next slide. So looking at the operative characteristics, you can see uh, one operation had to be converted to open due to adhesions. Two patients from the conservative arm required surgery. Two patients in the surgery arm had post-operative abscesses that were percutaneously drained. And two patients in the surgery arm unfortunately had anastomotic leakage, one requiring laparotomy and transverse ostomy, the other laparoscopic lavage and transverse ostomy, both with temporary stomas. This resulted in a 10%, so four patient 10% complication rate in the surgical group. Arslan now, will now look through the outcomes. Right, so the primary outcomes, which was gastrointestinal quality of life index score uh, between the baseline zero month and six month, uh, was statistically significant uh, with a mean uh, w difference of 11.96. Again, the similar primary outcome or GI quality life index as secondary outcome measured at six months was again statistically significant. Um, they also looked at the patients with the recurrence episodes of diverticulitis within six months and it was less uh, in the surgical group than conservative group, i.e. two in surgical group and uh, 12 in the conservative group. 
Other uh, outcomes were patient pain uh, perception and the pain at the six months from randomization. Now, both the groups were fairly satisfied with the treatment they received. Um, and looking at the visual uh, analog scale, which is the smiley face pain score, um, it was felt that the patient with, in the surgical group uh, did better than the conservative treatment group. So um, when looking at limitations, um, there were some self-reported limitations of the study. The trial, the trial was prematurely terminated, meaning the number of patients was low, and we feel that this, or they feel that this may well have affected their power calculations. The recruiting process was slow, and it took more than four years to finish. There was no sham surgery, though this would be tricky to do. It seems that it's possible, obviously, that there was a placebo effect in the quality of life results in those receiving surgery. The inclusion criteria were fairly strict. Recurrent diverticulitis had to involve three episodes in two years, so it's unclear actually whether surgery would have been beneficial for those with less frequent attacks of diverticulitis. There was various indications for surgery, but with most having, having it due to recurrent diverticulitis, and this actually prevented subgroup analysis. And the gastrointestinal quality of life index questionnaires were not answered by all. And this meant that the primary outcome was not accessible in all randomised patients and could have introduced bias to the results. They were the self-reported limitations, but we've picked up another few that will lead to discussion, I'm sure. Um, there was exclusion after randomization, such as the patient who had an MI in the surgical group who did not then receive surgery uh, and was not included in analysis. These should have been included in the intention to treat analysis to reduce bias. Inclusion criteria for the first subgroup of patients only required one episode to be verified using CT. We therefore question whether it was possible to conclude that all episodes were indeed due to recurrent uncomplicated episodes, as opposed to either complicated or indeed just persistent pain following an episode that would have put the patient in a different subgroup of, in of inclusion and, that, and then thus sort of affecting the stratification. Compliance with conservative, conservative management was not monitored, or at least monitoring was not recorded. And following on from that, that last point, patients who were not compliant to their conservative treatment may well be in the, the same group of patients who didn't complete their primary outcome survey and thus introducing selection bias. Stricture and fistula were both stated as complications in di of diverticulitis when defining for the inclusion criteria. However, both of these were then excluded and we feel this war warrants some clarification. Aslan, do you want to go through the conclusions of the trial? Right, so conclusion, um, they managed to prove that the quality of life index, um, as measured in the GI quality of life, uh, has um, been significantly better in patients who had elective surgery uh, than the conservative management within six months. However, it did carry a risk of about 10% of major complications. Um, overall, we gave a study about three and a half out of five. Um, there were some good points, well-designed study, correct statistical test utilized um, with people who needed an operation, had an operation and their quality of life improved. Um, and fairly, both groups were satisfied with the treatment they received. Um, shortcomings, uh, we felt that obviously they sh were they fell short with the recruitment. Uh, pre uh, The trial was stopped prior to where it was supposed to, uh, and the number of other limitations as discussed earlier. Um, complication rate, 10%. Uh, looking at the stoma failure, that's 5% five, five as 2 out of 41 had the um, an osteomotic leak, and looking at other literature, it is hovering around 2.5 to 3.5 percent uh, among other studies. Uh, transfer ostomy, um, I do not think so. That is something we do in this country because I've never seen anybody doing a transfer ostomy to salvage the clonic anastomosis. Uh, majority of the time, if they have an osteomotic leak, um, they had an osteomotic resection and, and stoma. Thank you very much for listening. Right, just a brief summary about the discussion we had about the paper um, after the presentation. A very important point that was uh, discussed is related to the uh, design of this study. As mentioned by the presenters, this is designed as a trial to determine whether surgery is superior to conservative treatment. So it's not designed as a non-inferiority trial, but a superiority trial instead which does have implications related to the type of statistical tests that are chosen to determine the sample size. 
And as you will notice from the uh, methodology session of this paper, um, every test that uh, has been used to determine sample size calculations uh, is two-tailed, which might not be appropriate when trying to determine whether one arm of the trial is superior to the other, rather than determining that it is not inferior. We will be asking the authors about this. A further very important point was related to exclusion after randomization and the intention to treat principle. Uh, this was highlighted by the presenters and we reiterated how this is uh, an essential core concept of any clinical uh, pragmatic trial. We then uh, had a discussion concerning the outcome uh, uh, used in this particular trial. Using quality of life measures such as the GIQLI does carry some implications related to uh, the placebo effect. Uh, which uh, obviously would be significantly more relevant in the surgical group compared to the conservative treatment group. And this does have significant implications in terms of biasing uh, the results. So we were wondering uh, whether a, a more objective measure of uh, quality of life and return to normal activity uh, could potentially be used, such as number of working days uh, lost. I'll uh, uh, now leave you to uh, Professor Sababela Subramanian lecture. Um, we keep you posted concerning the outcomes of our questions and stay tuned for more. So um, I think we'll talk about descriptive statistics in a couple of uh, parts. So we'll spend a few minutes today um, talking about some basic aspects of descriptive statistics. Um, I'll start off with some uh, general comments. Um, because the uh, talks so far have been more about epidemiology and research, research methodology and um, we thought we'll give some introduction on statistics. Um, it's really important to get a basic or an elementary understanding of numbers and statistics, I think, for a number of reasons. Uh, the two most important reasons are, one is you're reading papers and you're trying to understand scientific data and you're um, doing a critical appraisal of these papers so as to get the maximum out of it. And for that, you need to understand some um, uh, essentials in statistics. The other is, as a number of you um, people might be doing, is you're designing your projects, you're um, uh, writing papers on the data that you're collecting, and therefore um, a good understanding of basic statistics will um, and will help you hugely in, um, in, in writing your reports. And why am I talking about it? I've been involved in clinical and epidemiological research for uh, several years now, and I do use um, statistics um, to a more or less regular extent, but only basic, um, basic statistics. Um, I also organize a teacher and teach a module on cancer epidemiology for the university. So uh, I think that I might be able to give you some, uh, some useful information on the basics of statistics. But the caveat is that I'm not a statistician, nor do I have any formal qualifications in statistics. Right. So that's really important for me to say. Uh, but I hope that um, if I, as an average surgeon and clinical researcher, uh, are able to uh, give you some insight into statistics. I hope I, I do that from a very practical um, perspective, from a perspective that um, will encourage you guys to uh, also uh, try and understand the uh, um, elementary principles and start to apply um, the, these principles in your own work. Right, the way I see it, for surgeons and trainee surgeons and clinical researchers, there are three aspects or three areas where statistics or biostatistics is important. The first area is about uh, is um, uh, relevant to study design. So when you're designing a study, you want to uh, design a um, study that is appropriate for the clinical uh, question that you have in mind. And when you're deciding on the type of the study, you will use some principles of statistics to help you um, with the study type and the study design. And if you're doing a randomized controlled trial and you want to uh, um, ensure that you are adopting the right process of randomization, then again, you need some basic uh, statistical principles. If you're uh, in the process of 
determining how many patients you need for your trial, be it a randomized trial or a non-randomized trial, you need to um, understand a few basic statistical principles to be able to determine what the right size um, you should be aiming for. And also, when you're writing a proposal, um, you should be thinking about what kind of statistical tests you're going to be uh, uh, using um, when you're coming to analyze your data. So planning your statistical methods a priori is a very key uh, aspect of designing a good study. Okay, the other reason, um, the other area of statistics um, that um, we often use is what we call descriptive statistics. And in descriptive statistics, essentially what you're doing is you are simply defining, describing the data that you've collected. <coughs> and you might be using things like frequencies and percentages to describe the numbers of patients in different categories. You might be talking about the average or the central tendency as statisticians call it. You might be wanting to talk about the spread of your data and uh, you might be wanting to use specific charts and tables and figures to describe your data, right? And then as you imagine, um, almost any um, clinical research paper will have a significant element of descriptive statistics involved area which uh, um, tends to become a little bit more complicated is the use, for, use of inferential methods and essentially you make use of statistical methods to draw inferences from the data you've collected and you just described and uh, so that's the third um, area where you would want to have some knowledge of statistics right. so we'll just focus on uh, a little bit of descriptive statistics today the most important thing that people um, <laughs> when starting to get involved in statistics is what we call data types. Now, data types are presented and described in many different ways by different people. And often these different ways overlap and are redundant and cause a certain degree of confusion. So I'll try and present the most commonly used ways of uh, categorizing data types, and hopefully this will make some sense. So the first sort of uh, categorization, if you like, is dividing data into categorical data and measurement or scale data. So focusing just on categorical data, what do we mean? So if you're able to um, put the data value boxes or categories, then that's categorical data. A simple example would be gender. So you've got male and female, so there are two categories, and you categorize all of your patients as male or female. Another example would be, for example, tumor grade. So you might have tumor grades of one, two, three. So you've got three categories, one, two, and three, and you put all of your patients into one of these three categories. Okay, so that's categorical data. Measurement or scale data essentially refers to numerical data. And there are two main types, as you can see on the screen. The first type is um, what we call discrete data, and the second type is continuous data. Now, discrete data would be things like age and years at the time of diagnosis. So you're looking at completed uh, years since uh, birth. And it could be 60, 62, 70, 75, and so on. And you're not particularly interested in um, more detail than that. You're not interested if somebody is 70 years, three months, and five days. You're just interested in the number of years. So that is referred to as discrete data. Another good example in surgical research would be length of stay after surgery. So it could be five days, 15 days, 25 days, and you're not really interested in any more um, like hours and minutes. The other kind of data uh, in the measurement data that is one step further is what we call as continuous data. This is where you get your decimal points and your fractions. A good example would be BMI, and the BMI could be 25.37, and obviously you might want to uh, put some limits on how far down the decimal points you want to go, but essentially the data that, um, and that is measured uh, on a, a continuous scale um, without being limited um, by the mode of measurement is what we call continuous data. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. We'll look at the next category. So the next category, or the next classification if you like, is qualitative, semi-quantitative, and quantitative. Now you can see that I've boxed qual qualitative and semi-quantitative under categorical, 
and quantitative, um, which is effectively equivalent to measurement or scale. And the reason um, we are talking about these different classification schemes is because different people use different classification, classification schemes, different statistical software would call the same kind of data uh, using different terms. Okay, so that's why we're we are having to revise this. So qualitative data, as I said before, um, along with semi-quantitative falls under the umbrella of categorical data. So, um, and then and I've said, um, I've given you some examples before, like gender, two different sort of um, sets, male or female, and in semi-quantitative data, um, again, it is in categories, but the categories have a specific order. And quantitative data refers to numbers. Now, the third um, classification scheme, if you like, is, is as, as follows. So you've got nominal data, ordinal data, interval data, and ratio data. Okay, so let's just go through these uh, very briefly. So nominal data is essentially very similar to categorical data. So it falls under the same uh, group, if you like, where you have data and groups, right? Just like I said, gender is a good example of nominal data and all qualitative data or categorical data. They all mean the same here. And a gender is a classic example of a binomial data where there's only two um, uh, subsets, if you like. And they could be data that have a number of different um, subsets, and that could also be nominal, like, for example, the city of birth. So it could be Sheffield or York or Leeds or Hull. So you've got lots of different cities, and uh, um, they're all different, they're all separate, and they do not have any specific relationship to each other. So that's nominal data. Ordinal data, on the other hand, is data and categories, but have a specific order. A good example would be your Likert scales, where you ask patients or clinicians to agree with a statement and they'd say, uh, and you can give them choices, and that could range from strongly agree to strongly disagree. Have strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. So that would be a good example of ordinal data, where you know that there is a specific order. Like I said before, a grade is a good example of ordinal data as well. So you've got grade one, grade two, grade three. You know uh, that grade two is worse than grade one, and you know that grade three is worse than grade two. Okay, but you've got to keep in mind that the difference between orders does not have a specific meaning. In other words, um, you, um, you don't really know um, the difference between grade two tumor and the grade one tumor. You know grade two is worse, but you don't really know how worse. And those are the kinds of uh, data types that you would call ordinal. So there is an order in the groups, but the difference really doesn't make um, a lot of sense. Okay, the next step along this line is what we call interval data. Now, interval and ratio data, I'll explain together, they're both types of measurement data. They're both quantitative, in other words, numerical, right? With interval data, there is a difference between the values, and that difference has a numerical meaning. A good example is temperature. So, for example, uh, you've got temperatures of 0 degrees, 5 degrees, 10 degrees Celsius, let's say, and there's a difference between 0 and 5 and degrees Celsius, which is 5, and there's the same difference between 5 and 10, okay? There's a, there's a difference between the values, but the properties of the data set stop there. There isn't an absolute zero, and this is a type of data, interval data, where you um, don't multiply or divide these numbers. They won't make sense. For example, you look at temperature, there isn't really an absolute zero, okay? So if you have zero degrees Celsius, for example, it doesn't mean that there is no, um, there's absolutely no um, energy at that state. It doesn't mean that there's actually no heat, okay? So, uh, so that's what um, uh, interval data means. And ratio data essentially refers to um, numerical data where there is a difference between values and that has a meaning. And the ratio of two values also has a meaning. And this is the kind of data that has an absolute zero. Okay, height, for example, BMI, and so on and so forth. Okay, 
For all practical purposes, surgeons and surgical researchers could consider intervalent ratio data uh, as virtually uh, one the same thing. And you can use the, um, when, you, when you're describing the data sets, when you're using um, statistical methods, it won't make um, much sense for you to try and split the data into interval and ratio. You could consider all of this as the same kind of um, data. All right. So um, if you um, if you're still a little bit confused about these terms, um, look, come back and look at them again, and hopefully it'll all make sense. Let's move on. Right. So the other thing you've got to keep in mind is that you take a particular data set, let's say BMI, and you will find that the same data can be either used as a categorical uh, data set. So if you want to uh, uh, call it categorical nominal, then you can simply um, say that I'll categorize my patients as uh, obese or not obese, and you can have your own cutoff of 20, 25, 30, or whatever you want. You can classify this data as an ordinal data, where you classify them as underweight, normal, overweight, obese, and morbidly obese using your own categories. Or you can use the actual BMI of the patients, use the actual value, and consider this data as a measurement data or a scale data. Okay? And you've got to keep in mind that as much as possible, if you have the raw data, if you have the actual values, um, do not try and categorize them into uh, do not put them in boxes use the actual value or the raw value as it is in your analysis and you will find that um, you get more power in your calculations and your statistical method if you have absolute numbers use them right let's um, carry on so if you have data uh, that we've called nominal or ordinal data types such as gender type of cancer extent of surgery and so on. It's fairly straightforward to describe them. So you describe them as frequencies or percentages or both, ideally both. So you want to say how many had, uh, how many male, how many female and the percentages, right? So that's pretty straightforward. If you have measurement or scale data and the examples are here within brackets, you've got your BMI, length of stay, say after surgery, tumor size, if you're looking at a solid tumor, duration of surgery, pain scores, quality of life scores, and so on and so forth. If you're going to describe this data, then you need to use um, something called the central tendency or the average to say what the middle value is or what's your data all centering around. And you, you, you need to also explain another characteristic called the spread or the dispersion. In other words, say how much your data is scattered or not around the central value. Okay, so to describe your central tendency or average, um, you, you probably uh, remember uh, from your high school days, you can use the mean, the median, the mood maybe, but we rarely ever use mood in uh, biomedical research. Okay, so just the mean and the median, and we'll come to that in a minute. And when you're going to talk about spread or dispersion, you've got a number of different parameters. Variance, standard deviation, range, and interquartal range. These are the most commonly used ones. Okay, so we'll go through these in the next slide. So, average or central tendency. Mean, we've probably all heard of mean, essentially is the sum of all values divided by the uh, number of values. Okay, so that's um, pretty straightforward. As is median, median is simply the middle value when you um, rank all your values from the lowest to the highest or the highest to the lowest, it doesn't matter, and you go for the middle value, that's your median. Mode, like I said, is the most commonly occurring value and is not really um, used very often. And when you move on to dispersion or spread, you've got your variance. The variance is what it says here, the average of the square of the difference between each value and the mean. So what you do essentially is you take, you take each value, you subtract the mean from it, you square it, and you do that for every value, and you take the average. So if it's a little bit complicated, you could just um, Google up variance and uh, you will find exactly how the variance is calculated. So I won't dwell on it. Standard deviation simply refers to the square root of the variance. So you've got the variance, you, you just take the square root, you get the standard deviation. 
okay? Range is you take the minimum value and the maximum value and you find the difference, that's range. And interquartile range is simply the difference between the lower quartile and the upper quartile. So the lower quartile is um, 25th quartile. So if you uh, divide your, if you rank your observations from the lowest to the highest, you take the 25th quartile. So you take the median and then you take the middle value in the lower half of your rankings. And you do the same for the upper quartile, okay? And the difference between these two quartiles will give the interquartile range, interquartile range, all right? Now, why, um, now why do we have all of these different uh, measures of averages and dispersion of spread? They have the limitations and the advantages, and I wouldn't go into the details of each of these, but I'll just give you a little summary. And before we go to that summary, I need to talk to you about what we mean by a normal distribution. So you've probably all heard of the normal distribution. There is on your screen a normal distribution of the age at diagnosis of a large cohort of patients with a specific cancer. So what does this show? This simply shows you the frequency, the number of people at various ages, okay? So as you see on the screen, if you plot a histogram, and that's what this is, a histogram, which is where you take um, intervals of ages, and here you, the, the, you can see the, the intervals on the x-axis, 40 to 45, 45 to 50, and so on and so forth, and you plot the number of patients in each interval, then you have a bar for each interval, and um, you then take the middle of these bars, and you join those dots, and you get um, what we call uh, a, the distribution, the frequency distribution. Now, if the frequency distribution is, is normal, then that's got some important um, attributes for you to keep in mind. So that's important for you to know if your data set follows a normal distribution or not. Now, normal distribution is also called um, the Gaussian distribution or simply a bell-shaped curve. And to call a specific frequency distribution normal, um, it needs to fulfill certain key properties. The first thing is that there has to be some kind of symmetry, an approximate symmetry at least, around the central value. The central value or the average or the central tendency, let's say is around 60. You want to see some symmetry or the distribution of the data on either side of 60 need to be fairly symmetrical. Okay. The other uh, thing in a normal distribution is that you shouldn't really have any or many extreme values. Okay. And the last point to keep in mind is that if you calculate the mean, median, and mode, they should be um, very, very similar, if not identical, in a normal distribution. Okay. So if these three properties are uh, uh, followed or ticked, then you can say that your continuous or measurement data. Um, follows a normal distribution, all right? Okay, now you can use uh, mean and standard deviation in a normally distributed data set to estimate the frequency or the number of observations within a certain range. So if you um, take a normally distributed data set, you calculate the mean and the standard deviation, then you should be able to state that 68% of the values lie between mean plus or minus one standard deviation, 95% lie between mean plus or minus two standard deviation, and 99.7% of values lie between mean plus or minus three standard deviation. People to determine or to make an assumption that the data is normal. So um, people will typically look at the mean, median, and mode. Uh, they're fairly similar. They might look at how many uh, values lie between mean plus or minus one standard deviation. If it's around 65, 68, 69, then they'd be happy. And also um, look at the histogram. So the histogram looks reasonably normal, then they'd be, uh, they'd accept that uh, something's normally distributed. Obviously, you can be a bit more picky and you can say, you know, how, how can I say for sure? Then there are some statistical tests for normality that you can use, but that's outside the scope of this talk. Right. So going back to how you describe measurement or scale data. So we've talked about normal distribution. And if you remember from a couple of slides ago, we talked about measures of central tendency and measures of dispersion. So for data that follows a normal distribution, 
remember this, the central tendency parameter that you will use is mean. You should really use the mean. And for dispersion of spread, use the standard deviation. And that this is really important. And you find very often in papers and um, don't follow these simple rules. And that just raises the question in the minds of some of the readers um, or, or the readers with knowledge of some basic um, you know, biostatistics. But um, if you haven't used the right um, parameters to describe your data, then maybe you might not have used the right statistical tests either. OK. Um, for data that does not follow a normal distribution, for central tendency or average, use the median. And for dispersion of spread, use the range or the interquartile range. OK. If you, if you spend some time thinking about it, using some example data sets, you will um, see that it makes sense. You will see that if um, uh, you're using mean, the mean is very sensitive to extreme outliers. So if you have some extreme outliers, very low, very high values, the mean will be altered. But the median is not very sensitive to extreme outliers. Okay, And you know for a fact that um, in a data that you assume to be normally distributed, you really shouldn't have many extreme outliers. Okay, and In data that does not follow a normal distribution, essentially, uh, you are simply ranking the observations from lowest to highest and using the middle value as your estimate of the central tendency. I hope uh, um, that has given you some insight into uh, what kind of parameters to use when you're describing uh, different data types. Right, so we've talked about data types, we've talked about central tendency or average, and dispersion or spread as two ways of describing um, your data. We've just briefly mentioned what normal distribution is in the context of measurement data or scale data, which could be discrete or continuous, if you remember the data types. And we've talked about what measures to use for normally distributed data and what measures to use for data that is not normally distributed. And I guess in the next um, talk, we'll look at figures and graphs in describing data. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast.